Good morning, everyone. My name is Tara Lynn Gray, Chief Executive Officer of the Fresno Metro Black Chamber of Commerce and Chamber Foundation, where we engage, educate, and empower our Black-owned business community. Thank you for joining us today for this very informative and necessary webinar on how to prepare for reopening. Before we get started, please note that all participant microphones have been muted. There will be time for Q&A during the presentation. Please enter your questions at any time into the question box, which should be located to the right of your screen. The recording of this webinar will be posted to our website and social media platforms. In today's session, we're going to focus on the necessary steps to reopening your business and making sure that we all stay in compliance with state and local mandates to avoid further complications due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I am joined this morning by my co-sponsors, Courtney Espinosa with the City of Fresno, Eric Cherkaski with the Fresno Regional Workforce Board, and Don Golick, Director of the Fresno District Office of the SBA. And we have a special guest joining us this morning, Dan Larson, who's going to give you all kinds of tips and tricks and special things that you need to know. This program is funded in part by the Strategic Growth Council and California Climate Communities Investment. At this time, I'm going to turn things over to my co-host, Courtney Espinosa. Courtney, take it away. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. My name is Courtney Espinosa, and I am the Program Implementation Manager for the Transform Fresno Project, and I work for the City of Fresno. Um, I'm so excited to be on this today. This has been a long time coming. I know we worked really hard to put this on for you. I want to take this time to thank everybody for joining, and I know you will get some great vital information that will help your business in the future. I'll turn it back over to Eric. Thank you, Courtney. Good morning, everybody. I will be brief because we have a lot of groundwork to cover, but I am Eric Tchaikovsky. I'm with the Fresno Regional Workforce Development Board. I oversee their business services center. Probably everybody here is familiar with our workforce connection services for our job seekers. Uh, we here at the business services center do more of a, a deeper dive on that employer and business development piece. So part of that is helping you with your recruitment needs, but it's also connecting businesses to great development tools um, that we have to offer. For example, our FresnoForBiz.com referral system, where you can easily send in a referral request to get connected to a no-cost business service tool uh, that is provided from 12 different local agencies, including the Small Business Administration, among authors. Um, over these past few months, we have really been focused on layoff assistance, as you can only imagine, uh, through our rapid response program. I do wanna note that even though today's topic is gonna be focusing on reopening and going back to work, we do realize that there are still individuals that might be getting layoffs or maybe there are uh, temporary layoffs that are now turning into permanent ones as we do face reopening. Um, if that is the case, we are still offering our uh, online layoff orientations. Uh, it's every Thursday at 10 a.m. and I will direct you and I'll put this in the chat box to our website, www.fresnobsc, uh, BSD for Business Services Center, uh, dot com for more information on how to register and attend those sessions. Uh, that information includes uh, uh, programs from supportive agencies such as the Employment Development Department on UI benefits, Department of Social Services on uh, low-cost uh, health insurance programs, among other things. But for these past few weeks here at the Business Services Center, and I'm sure my colleagues can attest to, we have been focusing on the dramatic shift to reopening for businesses. And I can tell you, even though today's title of our workshop is Fresno Back in Business, I think we can all agree that business is not what it was just three months ago. And there is a lot of new uh, complex laws and regulations that we need to kind of understand in order to make sure that we are in compliance. Um, luckily that we here at the Business Services Center are uh, answering to that demand with our HR services. Um, we have an HR hotline, which we're gonna be talking about in a minute where you can schedule a one hour no cost consultation on how to stay in compliance uh, as you are reopening during the phased reopening process here in the city. And uh, we are very lucky to have one of our um, HR consultants with us today who's gonna be going over a, a great discussion 
on how to uh, be better prepared for that uh, piece. Uh, Dan Larson is with our HR provider, Sierra HR Pro Partners. He will be going over two areas today. The first one is on compliance and safety, so how to make sure you are taking into account um, you know, six feet social distance in your business, making sure your customers are aware of that, um, having uh, proper protective gear for your staff, and also performance expectations for your employees. You know, a lot of people might be coming in, they might have different duties now because there are limited staff, so maybe they're taking on different roles that they, weren't, uh, they didn't have initially. So how to make sure they're aware of that. Also, if you're like us at the workforce board and maybe you're working in different shifts, so maybe one group is working Monday, Wednesday, Friday, one group's working Tuesday, Thursday, you know, how to make sure everybody's aware of their duties, especially as we're working from home. So a lot of groundwork to cover. I'm gonna turn it over now to my colleague, Dan Larson, um, who will be going over some of these HR requirements as you uh, continue to reopen. Uh, Dan, take it away. Well, thank you, Eric. I appreciate that. And, and I, uh, I hope to hear from you as we go through this. Uh, as you have questions, that's, that's what we're here for. So please chime in and, and speak up and Eric will help make sure we keep track of all the questions that come through. To start off, this is a, a disclaimer you've probably seen quite a lot. We just want to let you know at the outset, this is not legal advice. And in fact, I'm not even an attorney. I'm a, an HR professional, so I, I can't even give legal advice if I wanted to. But this is just general guidance that will hopefully help you get started on the right foot. And if you need something more specific, uh, then please follow up with us. Like, like Eric said, we have both the hotline and those consultations on COVID-19 and, and adapting to those circumstances. Uh, I work for a company called Sierra HR Partners. Our focus is on uh, recruiting, training, and compliance, and we'll talk about the compliance piece today mostly. Uh, we are backed up by a business law firm in town, Doug Larson, he's the, the Larson, the L in that FLC. Uh, he helps make sure that everything that we do on the HR side is legally compliant and aligned with California state requirements and federal requirements. Uh, and then just one last pitch. I, uh, I hope that you call the HR hotline. Uh, that's a good partnership that, that we've had with, with Eric and his organization. We are thrilled to help, uh, to help business owners navigate these human resource complexities. It's really easy, even doing things that are, that are completely in line with common sense, uh, to get yourself into trouble. So give us a call before you make any, any uh, major decisions. Walk it walk us through your, your thinking, your thought process, your decision making, uh, and we can help hopefully avoid any, any pitfalls that you just might not be aware of. You can talk to me, uh, you can talk to one of my associates if, if you prefer that, and we are, we are happy to help. So screenshot that, I'm sure it's in the handouts, make sure that, that you have that available in case something comes up. Like Eric said, we'll be talking about two specific things, compliance and safety, those go together, of course. We wanna do the safe thing, we wanna do the right thing, uh, but often it's not enough to do the right thing, we have to do the right thing in the right way. And so we'll talk about how to be safe while also considering the local and the state uh, regulations so that we can, we can check off the boxes while we're taking the right steps. Uh, we'll also talk about those performance expectations in light of these changing circumstances and growing telework and other things we need to, to keep in mind. Let's start off with this compliance and safety piece. Uh, now we'll we'll start locally and then we'll grow to the statewide, at a city level, the most recent order we have is 2020-17, and that uh, essentially uh, that essentially changed uh, the city of Fresno's approach. They had been taking a lot of action unilaterally, and at this point, they decided to step off the gas and defer to California state regulations. Uh, so instead of having essential and non-essential businesses, we now have authorized and non-authorized businesses based on those state designations. We still have the requirement to post that social distancing protocol. I'll give you an example of what that's like. And, and uh, instead of making it easy for us, they still insist 
that we post that not on the normal eight and a half by 11, but on the 11 by 18 size paper. <clears throat> and then of course, business owners still have the requirement to require employees, customers, vendors, others who come into their facilities uh, to use face coverings. Now that social distancing protocol, I'm not gonna post the whole thing, but it's a part of that emergency order and you can see the top of it here. Your obligation is to apply those things that are relevant to you. So when it comes to, like Eric said, the disinfecting, the social distancing, the, the limiting of, of the number of folks that can come into your, your, your business, uh, make sure to look through those and then uh, pick those things that, that fit your business. We also have county orders here in the county of Fresno. Uh, really what we're getting from the county of Fresno is the directive to continue with health screenings. There are additional rules if you are a healthcare provider or if you have agricultural employees, uh, but typically for most of you that will be limited to the screening that you have to do. Now you don't have to do temperature screening, you're certainly more than welcome to if you'd like. The EEOC has said that that's permitted given the pandemic conditions that we have. Uh, but it can be as simple as asking employees about whether or not they are symptomatic or whether they live with folks who have been uh, tested positive for COVID-19. And then of course we want to exclude those employees from work. Uh, I'll tell you that there's, I've had conversations with more than a few employers who have uh, who have benefited from this practice of excluding symptomatic employees from work uh, only to find out later that they did in fact test positive for COVID-19 and removing them from work early on uh, as was facilitated by these screenings uh, allowed them to keep their other employees free from infection. Uh, we also, the, the county is requiring us to follow those CDC recommendations on allowing people to return to work uh, if they're symptomatic, that's typically 10 days following the appearance of those first symptoms and three days after those symptoms stopped, uh, unaided by any, any medication that might lower fever, for example. That screening tool can be very simple. Here's a picture of it right here. Uh, you have employees fill this out at the beginning of their shift or at the end of their shift, uh, and it's as simple as that. Uh, keep track of those from day to day and, of course, exclude employees from work. Who, uh, who don't pass these screenings so that we can make sure that we keep our employees safe. The big ticket regulations are gonna be those regulations from the state. Uh, broadly, there are five requirements for all businesses, and we'll go through those briefly. The first is to conduct a detailed risk assessment and create a site-specific protection plan. What that means for you is you're actually gonna to have to write something down. You're gonna to have to think about your disinfecting measures, your training measures, your social distancing measures, and what you do for screening, and put it in a plan. Now, based on your industry, there will be other requirements. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but just appreciate that you're, you're going to have to create something uh, that you can share with employees, that you can share with regulators in case anybody comes to audit your practices. Uh, this, this will be something that'll, that'll take some time and some, some thought. And it should build on a risk assessment. If you want to come talk to us at Sierra, we'll tell you the kinds of questions you can ask about as part of that risk assessment. Uh, but it's, it's thinking about the factors that are unique to your business. Do you have people coming in from the community? If you do, uh, that of course increases your business and you need to change your considerations to, to adjust for that risk. If, if you're hosting, a limited number of clients, one or two a day or one or two a week, that's gonna look much different than if you are a retail establishment or a restaurant or some other kind of business which mu with much more frequent community contact. Those are the kinds of things we're thinking about. What is your employee demographic? Do you have employees that fit those categories that put them at greater risk for COVID-19 contraction or of experiencing more severe symptoms? If you do, then that changes, again, changes your consideration. So that's all that the risk assessment is, uh, but that's, that's something that California is requiring of all businesses. They also require training on how to limit COVID-19 and how to conduct those, how employees can conduct their own self-screenings. Uh, they require that you put control measures into place and that you screen yourself, that you put 
disinfection protocols into place and that you uh, introduce those distancing guidelines that we are now all familiar with. But wait, there's more. I know you were just itching to hear those words come out of my mouth. If you, uh, based on your industry, there will be other requirements that you have to keep in mind. Now, if you are in an office environment, maybe that's the case for most of you, uh, then there probably is not going to be a lot different than what you've done now if you've been following closely these, these city or these county regulations. Uh, but if you're part of one of these industries, for example, and this is just a snippet of them, there are even more out there, uh, then what you need to do is click on each of these and look at the guidance and the checklist that the state of California has provided to you. Now, uh, just going backwards, that's all hyperlinked here that will be provided in your handouts. Uh, we may throw something into the chat box if you want to click on that link right now. Um, but just remember, California is now requiring that you create these plans and these measures, and there will be specific industry guidance based on the kind of company that you have. Here's an example of the office checklist. And these are just the kinds of things that you'll you'll have to keep in mind. You can see here that you need to designate a person responsible for implementing the plan. That means there's going to be a name attached to the plan, whether that's you or your HR person or your safety person uh, or somebody else. There, there's going to be a, a contact person that's necessary. Uh, you can see these other things. That's that's what we've talked about. But the the point of this slide is just to let you know that California has provided those tools to help you walk through these requirements. And if it still feels like too much, that's that's what we're here for. So work through the hotline, come talk to us folks at Sierra and, and we'll do what we can to help, to help you not only be safe, but to be safe in a way that complies with these California restrictions. Because we don't wanna get sideways with, with any of these regulatory bodies. It's, it's important again, to do the right thing, but to do it in the right way. One other regulation that's relevant, many of you may have heard about it, but some weeks ago, Governor Newsom signed an executive order that broadened workers' comp protections. And essentially what it says is if you've worked between the middle of March and the beginning of July and you test positive for COVID-19, we're just going to assume that you got it from work. Uh, and because we're assuming that you got it from work, we'll make sure that your care is paid for and provided for through that workers' comp structure that, that already exists. What that means for employers is if somebody tests positive, we're gonna to need to follow that typical workers' comp process that we do if, if there's ever any other injury. So we, we provide the employee with that DWC-1 form. We, uh, we have that conversation with our workers' comp carrier to get this, the paperwork started on their side, and then that process will proceed. Now, the state of in Governor Newsom's order, he talked about how the presumption that somebody tested positive because of contact at work, that's, that's a rebuttable presumption. That means that we'll have the chance to contend it and uh, uh, perhaps have it be covered outside of our workers' comp process. They didn't provide any specifics on what exactly that looked like, so that would be part of the follow-up conversation you need to have with your workers' comp folks if you have somebody test positive inside your organization. Now, as you're thinking about how to be safe and what you need to do, it boils down to, to four broad categories. They won't be a surprise to any of you. We want to make sure that we train employees both on safe practices uh, and what happens if somebody tests positive for COVID and the kinds of leaves and entitlements that are available, the types of state benefits that are available if somebody falls into that category. Uh, so that's the first one, we have to worry about employee training. That second one, we need to make sure we are screening employees, and we've talked about that. That can be as simple as the questionnaire that you ask employees at the beginning of work, or if you are in a more risk-heavy environment, maybe that does involve temperature screenings for employees and visitors that, that come into your facilities. That third element is all about disinfecting, and then of course, that, that last one is all about social distancing. Dan, we have a question that just came up. Um, well, sure. Yes, someone was asking if an employee uh, tells their employer that their spouse had contacted 
uh, COVID-19 from an, something out, from outside of work, and now they want to get tested as a precautionary measure, are uh, is the employer still obligated to provide them workers' comp forms? Uh, probably not, from what you're saying. If if the, I, I would only expect those workers' comp forms to come into play if if our employee eventually tests positive. Um, if they want to go get tested as a precautionary measure because of because of some family relationship that that really happens outside of work, then that's fine. But it but it sounds like that that will just stay outside of work. If they if they subsequently test positive, then that might be part of that rebuttable presumption that we talked about. And so we can say, hey, we know they've been working between middle of March and the end of July or the beginning of July, but they have a family member with whom they've maintained close contact who also tested positive before they tested positive. And then my my presumption would be that that's, that's how your workers' comp folks would handle it, and that would that would be handled outside of your, your workers' comp benefits structure. Uh, but if we're talking about a family member that's unrelated to work, the employee just wants to get tested as a precaution, uh, that's fine. If they do test positive, we do have to start that workers' comp process, but it will probably be, be slid out of that process once the facts come out about the personal contact. Does that address the question you think, Eric? I think so. And I, I think just to kind of make it a, a broader answer too. So if somebody does, uh, it's it's at the point where they actually test positive for COVID-19 that they may be uh, uh, applicable to, to get workers' comp, correct? Correct. That's right. Okay. We have two more questions if you have a minute. Somebody had asked too, if, if they're a smaller business with 10 or less employees, um, who don't necessarily have a lot of support, how can they go about with developing a, uh, a preventive plan or a, a COVID-19 response plan for their business? Uh, that's a really great, great question. We are sympathetic, of course, to, to small business owners. Uh, many of many of, of the folks who are tuned in today are probably small business owners. There are no size limitations on any of these, these regulations. Uh, so that means we're we're stuck with it. This is the reality. Uh, we provided you the links to the things that California is saying. Uh, it can feel like a lot. It can feel overwhelming, but I, I think they've done a pretty good job laying it out for you. And then not only giving you guidance, but giving you checklists that you can you can check your plan against. Uh, it'll it'll just mean an investment of time. And if and if it's still if things still aren't clicking for you, that's that's why we have the HR hotline, uh, the partnership between between us and between Eric. So uh, holler at us, come, come chat with us, and, and we will uh, help you make sense of, of those different requirements. And then what is the penalty for employers who fail to comply? Uh, it probably depends. I haven't seen any penalties associated with these California guidelines, um, but I, I worry that OSHA and Cal OSHA will get involved. Uh, you know, up until this pandemic, this pandemic has kind of taken everybody's attention, but up till this pandemic, one of Cal OSHA's focuses was heat, heat illness prevention, uh, the provision of shade and water and rest. Um, and because that was their focus, they would implement punitive penalties for employers who violated these regulations. Uh, so I've seen, I've seen penalties upwards of, of $7,000, $8,000 per violation for the failure to train employees about heat illness if they're subject to it, or the failure to provide water adequately. Uh, and they bump those those fines up because they intend them to be punitive. It, it would not surprise me if there is a, a focus shift from something like heat to infectious disease prevention and response. Uh, and if, if we are not meeting our obligation, then Cal Ocean can come in and, and say, Here's a here's an eight thousand dollar fine. We don't even have to be subject to these these health safety standards. Everybody is subject to the general safety standard. That's the one that requires you to make an injury and illness prevention plan. And that standard says you have to address all the hazards that face your workplace. Well, now the pandemic is a hazard that faces our workplace. And so if we fail to address that, uh, Cal OSHA loves to do that. They'll they'll come in through the the IIPP standard, that safety plan standard. Uh, and nail you and say, well, you didn't you didn't effectively address the hazards that your employees face. So 
I don't, I don't have a specific answer for you. I worry that there, there is the potential for penalties with, with dollars and cents attached to that. Um, and even beyond that, we want to make sure that, that we keep our folks safe. So that, that's, that's both sides of the coin, right? The safety and compliance. We, we want to stave off that financial risk, that risk of regulation enforcers coming down on us. Uh, and we want to keep our, our folks safe. And again, it's, it's, it's going to take some time. It's going to take some thought. But it's, it's within reach and the tools, the tools are out there. It'll, it'll just take that, that time on the front end. Thank you, Dan. We have a great couple question. more questions. Yeah, that's a good, great question. A couple more for you. Um, an individual asked, can we require all employees to take advantage of the free testing before they return to work? And what if they refuse to take a test before returning? So I'm trying to think of, of the kinds of scenarios where we would, we would want to compel them to test. If, if somebody is symptomatic, for example, then we can, we can prohibit them from coming to work we can, uh, until they pass that 14-day window that the CDC has given us. Now, the, the thing that will encourage them to test is getting medical professionals involved is what entitles them to these federal benefits. Many of you may have heard of the, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. I'm just going to call it the FFCRA if that's okay. But that's where we get emergency paid sick leave and expanded FMLA for folks that need to take care of their kids. To qualify for that emergency paid sick leave, that EPSL, they need to fit into one of five categories. And the two that, that deal with employees who may be sick the reason number two requires them to be quarantined by a medical professional and reason number three mean is is that they need to be symptomatic and seeking care both of those things are important and so if you have an employee that's symptomatic and they think Haha, this is great i'm just going to go home and sit on my couch for two weeks and get paid watching netflix that's that's not going to happen they have to go and seek that care and, and so I think that's probably the angle to come at it from if you want an employee to get tested you just you say hey you have symptoms I need to exclude you from work if you want those FFCRA benefits you're going to have to seek care and the first step in seeking care is getting that test go get that test and we can start on talking about how to return you back to work I'm hoping that that addresses it for you Eric. that was very good thank you Dan we have another question that just came in that actually I've heard a few times is a good question are there designated people going around checking businesses to ensure that they're in compliance? So I don't know, maybe a health official, are, are they periodically going to businesses that are reopening to ensure that they're in compliance when their operations are, are back at it for customers? I haven't, I haven't seen that. Um, and in fact, the city of Fresno in their, in their messaging around the, the most recent health order, um, have have kind of lessened. They've they've stepped back from that active enforcement. I, I think they realize folks were turned off by it, and, and maybe um, some of our other panelists have experience with that. They're they're welcome to chime in. If so I haven't seen that. Um, I think they will be responsive to employee complaints or reports. And and so if you have employees who think that they are that you are not being sufficiently cautious, that you're not uh, taking the steps. To, to create a plan and implement a plan in order to, to keep them safe, um, then you may have them call in the, the county public health department. And that might be the thing that instigates a visit. I would expect that more than, you know, roving bands of county health officials trying to find businesses that are out of compliance. I, th I think there are just too many, too many businesses to, for that to be feasible, but, but I, I trust that they would be responsive to employee complaints. Yeah. Does that round off the questions you have so far, Eric? Actually, we have two more if you have a minute. So another yeah. question is, uh, if an employee says a family member they live with tested positive, does the family member have to stay home from work? And if so, how long? I so think I, the, I guess, yeah, I guess the, the follow-up to that was um, also, if, if the family member has tested positive, does the individual also have to stay home if they have a positive case in their household? I, th I think the answer is yes, and and the problem that we have is somebody that, especially the county, the Fresno County Health Department, directs us to keep employees away uh, if if for 14 days after they've been exposed. The problem that we have with people who are are living together 
is that exposure kind of resets every every single day. We don't start that 14 day clock because they just wake up the next morning in the same household as somebody who is still uh, within that contagious window. And so if they're with somebody, if they're if they're living in a home with somebody who is who has tested positive for COVID-19, I mean, we, we talked briefly about those returning from isolation. That's what how the CDC talks about. How do we return somebody from isolation? And they say, somebody who's tested positive or, or having those symptoms, it's 10 days after the first appearance of those symptoms, and then at least three days after the, the conclusion of those symptoms. And so if you're living with somebody in the middle of that window, that exposure clock keeps getting reset. And so we can't start that second person's 14-day quarantine period until we're out of that first positive test case, uh, contagion, window, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so there, everybody's situation is going to be different. We're going to have to look at the factors. We're going to have to look at if exposure really exists there. Um, but my thought is that, that we will have to direct them to stay at home, and it may be longer than 14 days if that exposure is ongoing, meaning if, if they keep living with these folks. Uh, those emergency paid sick leave benefits are only going to cover two weeks. So that's that's going to be something that factors into the conversation, too. Great. Thank you, Dan. Perfect. So we've talked about these things. And, and so this conversation will be easy. That first bullet, I, I mentioned it earlier, the IIPP standard that regulates all employers means that you have to address hazards. So even if you aren't subject to any of these, these other health or agricultural or ventilation standards, they will get you through the IIPP standard if you don't think seriously about this. And the way that we, we reduce risk, ideally, is by starting at the top of that hierarchy. We're not gonna be able to eliminate this risk until we get a vaccine, we're obviously not there now. And so that moves us down that pyramid to think about engineering and administrative controls. Uh, for example, any of you who've been to the grocery store will remember, what do you see when you go to check out? We have those panels, right? That is an engineering control. It's, it's a change to the environment to isolate people from that hazard. Uh, there's been talk of installing new ventilation systems. I imagine that's going to be a tremendous expense. That's probably not going to make sense for most of us. It doesn't make sense for the office that I'm in. Um, so we have to think about panels or doors or physical separations. Where that does not make sense, that's where we implement process changes, and that's what administrative controls are. Those are the six feet between people standing in a line or the limitation of the number of people that can come into our business. And if those fails, that's when we move to PPE. That's, that's, those are things like masks or gloves or gowns. Uh, so as you put your plan together, try to start at the top of that pyramid. Think about what engineering controls, what physical changes can you make to your workplace where that's not feasible. Think about how you change those processes. And only when those fail, we move on to telling employees to wear masks or to wear gloves uh, or to wear gowns. I'm gonna go through this, we'll, we'll circle back to it on the performance section, but just briefly to talk about disinfection. I'm hoping that all of you are, are doing some kind of disinfection. Really that, that means wiping down those frequently touched surfaces, and you see that here, workstations, keyboards, telephones. Employees can be responsible for their own workstations, that should work great. Uh, we want to discourage shared tools as much as we can. Uh, and of course, the EPA maintains a list of approved disinfectants. All of these things are actually part of the state required plan that we talked about earlier. And so as, as you make plans for these kinds of things, that'll meet those state requirements. If you've been meeting the, the Fresno City social distance or uh, the, that appendix, those social distancing protocols, that'll meet lots of these same state requirements. What happens if somebody tests positive? Uh, the good news is that if it's been more than seven days, the CDC says there's really nothing to do. And that's not uncommon actually, because what we do is we exclude employees who are showing symptoms, right? And then typically it takes at least a day or two for them to be tested. And then there's a lead time on the back end for those test results to come back. And so it's not uncommon at all for us to learn about an employee who tested positive for COVID-19, 
and it's been seven or eight days already. In that case, there's really no need for enhanced disinfection. If you want to think about it this way, the, the damage that was going to be done has already been done, so there's nothing for, else, for us to do outside of the typical stuff we already do. But if we are in that seven-day window, the CDC says uh, you start your enhanced disinfection by ventilation, if you can, for up to 24 hours or whatever amount is feasible for you. Clean that air out because we know this isn't just a surface-borne infection, this is an airborne infection. So we want to clear the air out and then we can move to cleaning the surfaces. If we do it the other way around, the air is still going to be bad and that can still uh, infect those surfaces. And then we do that deep disinfection. Rather than just perhaps commonly used surfaces or areas, we move into entire spaces where that employee may have uh, helped spread that infection. Non-porous surfaces, like your countertops or your desks, uh, you do those like normal. If you don't have a disinfection, then what the CDC says is five tablespoons of bleach per gallon of water. And that'll make something that'll, that'll disinfect those spaces. For porous surfaces, things like curtains or tablecloths, uh, what you don't want to do is shake it because that's just going to make anything that was on those porous surfaces go into the air and we don't want to, we don't want to do that. So be careful with them and just launder them in the warmest water possible in line with whatever the care instructions are. The folks that you have do that job, thankfully the CDC tells us the risk to them is very low, uh, but they should still wear that PPE. So that includes gloves and gowns and masks, and then they'll wanna make sure they wash their hands afterwards before they touch their face or their eyes or anything, anything like that. So that's what I have from a safety and compliance perspective. Do we have any more safety questions, Eric, before we wrap up? We have up? a couple more before you go into the employee performance. Great. So first question, what if it, with you know CBOs, community-based organizations and nonprofits, they have a lot of volunteers that may be working for them. Should they adopt language for volunteers that are similar to what they do for employees? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, depending on your, your, your business needs and your facility, you may consider even limiting the kinds, the, the number of volunteers or the types of volunteers that you have. Um, but absolutely, anybody who enters your facility is subject to these same safety guidelines. So they should, for example, complete the screening and get their temperature checked if that's what you do with other folks. They should be required to wear masks uh, when they enter your building. And depending on the work that they do, maybe then they can take them off. I'm in a closed office, for example. So I wear a mask when I come into work. I come into my office, shut the door, and then I can take it off. Um, Whatever rules you have for your full-time or part-time folks, your employees, uh, absolutely carry those forward to any volunteers that are necessary to continue your operations. Awesome. Another question, I, to be clear, so does an employer not have to pay the additional sick leave and or expanded FML benefits unless the employee provides proof that they receive medical care? I, I think that's right. We, we are going to be claiming tax credits for all these benefits that we pay out. Uh, and, it's, and that's a wonderful thing. We're, we're gonna be paying an employee to be gone for two weeks, but at least on the back end, even though it's, it's very disruptive to float that kind of expense, particularly for lots of employees, but at least on the back end, we can claim that as a tax credit. And we wanna be sure that if the IRS comes knocking on our door, that we can substantiate that, yes, we, we paid this benefit in, in alignment with whatever the requirements are. So if an employee is going to come to us and say, hey, I, I qualify for that EPSL under reason two, the, the one that says my doctor quarantined me, then it's completely reasonable for us to say, great, give me a copy of that doctor's note so that I can substantiate that we've paid this benefit correctly and appropriately. If they say, oh, I have <coughs> <coughs> symptoms, I have symptoms and I'm seeking care, we say, great, take care of yourself, take as long as you need. Please give me that proof of the care that you sought, the, the doctor's direction to you to go test or those positive test results or those negative test results given back to me so that I can substantiate to the IRS that I paid this benefit to you appropriately. I have, I have no problem with that at all. Awesome. Last question is, um, what if an employee does not live with a person that tested positive but claims they were exposed to that relative? Uh, so, so I think the answer is, is twofold. I think we as a business owner have to 
have to take the steps to keep our facilities and our employees safe. And so we might say, you think you're exposed? Okay, I need you to stay at home for two weeks. And that's fine. Uh, what the employee is gonna be thinking is, this is great, two weeks of Netflix, right? Um, so we need to make sure to have that follow-up conversation and say, oh, by the way, if you intend to get paid for this time off, you need to seek care or you need to go see your doctor because that's a part of receiving these benefits. Uh, we do our part by excluding them from work following a meaningful exposure. If they wanna get paid though, there's gonna be more that they have to do on the back end and, and more that they have to substantiate so that we make sure we're doing the right thing. So I think that answers that question. Yes, thank you, Dan. Actually, one more just came in too. Given the nature of this unknown disease, um, so again, going back to if, there, if there's anybody maybe who will be coming to, to check on employees, um, is there an, it, do you guys anticipate maybe there will be more monitoring by the government to businesses to ensure that they're gonna be in compliance? Um, as we continue to reopen? And, and that's kind of an estimation question, a, a guess question. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all. Um, and, and again, I, I think that will be spurred more often by employees who are concerned. You know, and, and, and perhaps this is a good time to talk this. As we reopen, people will engage in, in behaviors of varying risk, right? Restaurants are reopening. You will have lots of employees who are still very anxious, reasonably anxious, and they're not leaving their home. You have other employees who are cabin fever crazy. They are ready to go out and who cares what restaurant is open? They're gonna go to that restaurant because they can now. Um, the employees, the former employees will not always be comfortable with the choices of the latter employees. And while we can take action against employees who, for example, travel internationally to areas where the CDC tells us we shouldn't be traveling, we can't really take action against somebody for being part of an approved, authorized phase two reopening. Uh, and so that means we're gonna be able, we need to be able to lean into our safety measures. And so if we have anxious employees come talk to us, we need to be able to say, look, I understand that you're anxious. <coughs> That's why we've taken all these steps to protect you from infection, because we have no idea what you're doing. We have no idea what kind of exposure might happen, in, might happen and, and that's to this question. We don't know who's gonna come into contact with who, and ultimately we, we have no control over that. That's why we wear masks or disinfect or socially distant. So to, to hedge against anxious employees who make reports and potential future regulatory inspections, that's that's why we need to lean into that because that will be the source of reassurance uh, to the people that work with you as employees engage in all kinds of different behavior or spend time with different kinds of people that make risk averse employees very nervous. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? That's it, thank you, Dan. You're welcome. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about those anxious employees real quick. What happens if you have an employee who says to you, uh, I'm not interested in coming to work. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's safe. I don't wanna take that risk. Uh, really what that is, is employees getting their own ideas about what their job requires. And even before this pandemic, they always had their ideas about what their job requires. We tell them that they start at eight o'clock in the morning and they waltz in at 8.23 like it's no problem. That's not your job. Your job is to start at eight o'clock. Uh, that's really no different from what we're seeing right now. We say, your job requires you to be here. And they say, well, I'm, I'm not comfortable with that. Uh, our response to that can be, oh, okay, so you're, you're telling me you're quitting then. Unless they fit into one of these eligibility or one of these leave entitlements, they're not eligible to take time off from work at their discretion. Uh, and so we can we can push back against that. Of course, we, we wanna make this a win-win situation. If receipts and revenues have been down, we have an opportunity for fewer hours, and maybe we give it to these employees that are a little bit nervous. Uh, of course, we talk our safety plans, but if, if employees are not willing to come back to work, we can we can push back against that. And that's part of how we manage that performance. We can say, this is what the job requires. 
we've taken the safety precautions necessary to, to ensure your safety and the safety of your peers. Uh, if you're telling me that that's not acceptable to you, then it sounds like you're resigning. Uh, so keep that in mind as you're having these kinds of discussions. Again, we want to keep it positive. We want to look for win-win uh, arrangements, but we don't have to be subject to employee whims or to their discretion. You're going to need to think about virtual work now to some degree, and you're probably going to need to have those conversations. What happened is now we have a, a nation and a world full of employees who have seen their businesses rotate on a dime or stop on a dime, right? We have, we have seen the vast investment in resources that allow for virtual work. We've seen a change in habits. Now, maybe that's not the ideal way for you to, to do your work, but you're gonna need to have these conversations with employees who now realize that flexibility is possible. Maybe it's not ideal, but it's possible. And it's maybe even something that they've been doing for the past one month or two months or three months. Uh, so be prepared to have those conversations beyond simply, we don't do that anymore. Because what'll happen is employees who can leave, will leave for businesses that can offer the flexibility that they're looking for. And work through these kinds of questions. Think about it sincerely. Is, are there positions where we can allow kind of virtual work or a balance of virtual work? Doesn't need to be all the time. Uh, as long as we think about what success means. Um, there may be places where that doesn't make sense. There may be places where that doesn't work. That's fine. Uh, but be prepared to have those kinds of conversations. If you do implement some kind of virtual work, SMART goals are going to be more important than ever, as will those regular conversations. Maybe you don't have formal tag-ups or one-on-one -on -one meetings set up right now because you get the chance to interact in the office fairly regularly. If you have people that are working virtually, we need to be more intentional about setting bi-weekly, monthly tag-ups. And in those tag-ups, we will be reviewing the progress that we've set in those SMART goals. You likely are familiar with that acronym. There's lots of different versions of that acronym, but typically it's all about setting goals that are specific and measurable and goals with deadlines attached to them so that we're able to follow up. We, if we're asking somebody if they, if they made 16 widgets or if they handled 18 cases, uh, that's specific enough that we can follow up on it during our monthly or our bi-weekly tag-ins. We also need to be thinking about it when we hire, of course. If, if we are going to allow specific positions to go and work virtually predominantly, then maybe that's something we fold into these job, job descriptions and these job requirements. We need somebody who is tech savvy or self-motivated or independent because they will be working primarily through technology and outside of direct observation. So building those into your job descriptions, and hopefully those are things that you have because those are, those are pretty essential to performance management conversations, but building those into your job descriptions that you're already using for performance management will help you keep employees accountable. So Dan, since we're on the topic of working from home, here's a, a scenario from a question we had. Uh, what do you have an employee who maybe is working virtually, maybe full time now, uh, and say that they got um, they got diagnosed with COVID-19? How do you deal with that situation? Are they still eligible for um, paid leave or, or workers' comp? They probably are if they've worked non-virtually. The 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 executive order makes a it, it does differentiate between on-site work and virtual work. And so if somebody contracts COVID-19, but they've been working virtually since February, uh, we don't have to work through those workers' comp provisions. If, if they've come into the office occasionally or at all, or if they, they didn't go virtual completely until April, for example, uh, then we're gonna need to follow those workers' comp provisions. We're, we're looking for in-office work between March 19th and I think July 5th. Uh, when it comes to leave, even if they're working virtually, yes, they would still be eligible for that emergency paid sick leave if they fit those eligibility criteria. They don't need to be working in an office in order to be in order to qualify for leave from work. So I guess the the short answer is it depends on the on the scenario. Right, workers comp maybe EPSL probably. 
One more question for you too. Um, what if there's an employee that maybe was on maternity leave um, and uh, now they don't really feel comfortable coming to the office because they have a, a baby? So that that fits really well with that that anxious employee slide that we were talking about. Now somebody may be eligible for leave entitlements. If so, it sounds like the baby's here, but if if they are pregnant, they are eligible. There, technically, there's no such thing as maternity leave, and and I don't mean I don't mean to be a stickler, but it, the the leave that you're eligible for depends on your circumstances, and and that changes. So. If, before the baby comes, they are likely eligible for what's called pregnancy disability leave. That's leave of up to four months if a doctor basically excuses them from work. I, I think it would be very likely if somebody is pregnant for their doctor to say, yes, I, I certify that they need to be excused from work. And they potentially have those four months of time uh, before the baby comes or even after the baby comes if they're disabled by childbirth. After the birth, if you're at an organization of 20 or more, that means the employee is eligible for bonding leave, or, or sometimes it's called parental leave. And that's another three months of time off. And so maybe there's an opportunity, again, for those win-win arrangements. We say, hey, I, I know you're nervous about coming to work. You still have 12 weeks of parental leave. Why don't we start that right now and see where we are at the end of it? Um, once we are outside of those entitlements, though, we have room to push back if that's what we want to do. We can say, this isn't going away until we have a vaccine. We're still months away from a vaccine. There will always be risk. Now, if, if, you, don't, if you don't want to tolerate that risk because of your family situation, that's okay. But then I'm, I'm hearing that you're resigning, right? And, then, and that's the direction we go in. The job requires this. It includes some element of risk. You can decide that that's too much risk for your personal circumstance. That's okay. But in that case, we're needing to have a much different conversation now about whether or not you want to continue in this job because this job requires ABC. Thank you, Dan. Very good. If you have somebody working virtually, I'll just mention these things quickly and wrap up. You got to be careful about protecting your intellectual property. Uh, you don't want employees using their own devices because they can store things and access things later on, even if you don't want them to. So uh, the intellectual property that you have is a source of great value for your organization, whatever it is. Uh, so part of protecting that is just making the investment in technology if virtual work is something that makes sense for what you're doing. Uh, you can also create policies. Those policies aren't necessary in order to enforce your IP protections, um, but it helps to let employees know that you're going to be coming after them if they misuse or disseminate your IP. So put those protections into place, have those conversations, and hopefully that will limit your exposure. Also, if you have non-exempt employees working virtually, it's just the same as if you had non-exempt employees working in office. They still have to track their time. They still have to take their meal and rest periods. They still have to be paid for all their overtime. And if, you, if you're giving them the tools to work virtually, it's a lot more likely that they will answer an email at eight o'clock at night. Uh, if they stopped work at five, then that's probably overtime and we also have to worry about split shift pay. So if you're giving non-exempt employees the ability to work virtually, just make sure you don't forget those other wage and hour considerations that you have to think about all the time because they all still apply. And then finally, the last thing I'll say is that you gotta worry about reimbursement. Your legal obligation is to indemnify your employees for all necessary expenditures or losses. We don't get anything more specific than that, unfortunately. So uh, that creates ambiguity and ambiguity creates risk in lawsuits and we don't like that. Um, but we gotta think about the potential expenses that employees may incur or even the expenses that they incur when there's no extra expense. An employee who has an unlimited data plan is not going to incur any extra expense doing work on their cell phone. But if you're making them do work on their cell phone, you have some responsibility to indemnify them. So if we're, if we're thinking about equipment and tools like computers or phones, it, we're thinking about internet or data or connectivity, we're thinking about maybe increases in cost. If they have a basic internet plan, but they need a fancy internet plan 
to do the work at home that you require them to do because of video conferencing and things, we're gonna to need to indemnify them for that difference. Now, just as an example, there was a court case on cell phone use and reimbursement for cell phones. They said that we have to indemnify somebody a reasonable percentage. What does that mean? I, <laughs> I don't know. The court didn't give us any direction. So that's frustrating. Um, some guidance is what is necessary, not what is preferred. And so if a basic plan is sufficient, but an employee wants a fancy plan, well, we just have to pay for that basic plan and they can pay for the difference if they want something a little bit fancier. What you wanna make sure that you do is show that you've thought about it, show that you've done the math. You think about what their cell phone usage is like, for example, or you think about what their internet usage is like. You try and differentiate between work data and personal data. You look at their monthly expense and you, you come up with a number that works. Uh, if you're not doing that, then you're just paying for the whole thing and that, that covers your bases too. So that's all I have for you. I just want to remind you about the hotline and I'm happy to take one or two minutes of questions if, if you have any more for Eric. Um, otherwise, we'll we'll cede the time back to Don. Yeah, and we got two more questions before we turn it over to Don. Uh, thank you again, great information. So individual asks, um, how should an employer handle leave if the business has over 500 employees? So if that, does that infected employee solely fall under non-emergency? FMLA? So yeah, that, that has a big impact. If somebody is over 500 employees, they are exempted from the FFCRI benefits. And the, the reason for that is, is legislators assume that if you have more than 500 employees, you can put something into place uh, without government mandate or government assistance. So those are, those are completely off, off the table uh, if you have more than 500 folks. And here's a question I've, I've been hearing a few times. Is there like an end date where all of this becomes obsolete? One person mentioned the date of July 5th is what they've seen. So, so the July 5th, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, you're, you're good. The July 5th date probably comes from that workers' comp executive order. That's the date that they put there. These FFCRA benefits expire December 31st of this year. Um, I, I don't know that I would take any of those dates as gospel if we're looking for an end to some of these issues. Uh, in many cases, those dates were picked because the situation is so fluid, we don't know what's going on. Um, the, the unemployment benefits that are bolstering state unemployment benefits, that extra $600, that's gonna end at the end of July. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's some kind of legislation that continues that. Part of, part of what happened is early on, legislators were just trying to react because things were falling apart at a, at a terrifyingly quick pace. And so they just put something out there to duct tape things together until we could have more information to figure things, these, these things out. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't expect these things to end or I wouldn't bank on them ending, but we just kind of have to keep an eye out for additional legislation as these lawmakers have a chance to consider new and current information and decide whether or not to extend these things. But yeah, so workers comp ends July 5th, UI benefits end July 31st, FFCRA benefits end December 31st. We just have to, we have to keep an eye on it because things are changing all the time. Great, thank you so much, Dan. And you know, as Dan reminded us, if you do have any other questions, we do have this human resources hotline. The slide is up on the uh, power, the presentation right now, 559. 2304062. It is all confidential. It is one hour of no cost consultations to help your business if you're looking for further information on reopening. And maybe I'll just I'll just add it is confidential, like you said, Eric, but um, because of this partnership, we like to track and substantiate that that people are calling. So we will ask where you're calling from. We're not gonna share it to anybody. We just want to make sure that we let the business services center know that real people are actually calling. So don't don't be yes. thrown off. We ask you who you are. But we do not share any business names. That's what we should specify. Right. Yes. Thank you, Dan. Tara, we'll turn it over to you now. What a great session that was. Lots and lots and lots of information. 
At this time, we are going to turn things over to SBA um, District Director for the Fresno Office, Don Golick. We've had Don on so many times um, in the past, and she has just been a lifeline for us and has provided tremendous information as things were breaking back in March. And um, she suffered through changes to the system, the flood of calls and daggers and um, all kinds of stuff these last couple of um, months. Dawn, um, why don't you go ahead and give us an update on where things are. We have some good news that the IDOL portal has opened again and We've got information on, on PPP loan forgiveness. And so why don't um, I be quiet, you take it away, and give us an update on what you and your team are doing. Well, sounds great. Thank you, Tara. Uh, it's always great to spend some time with Tara and her team and the Workforce Investment Board in the city. So I'm glad to be with you this morning. I'm Don Golick. I'm the District Director for the Fresno SBA District Office. We serve the 15 counties of the San Joaquin Valley and Central Coast. And uh, I know the last several months have been incredibly difficult for small businesses. So I want to give you an update on two key programs that have really been a lifeline for small businesses over these last several months. The Economic Injury Disaster Loan, or EIDL, and the Paycheck Protection Program Loans, or PPP. So let's talk a little bit this morning about EIDL. So as Tara mentioned, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Portal has at various points over the last several months been open for small businesses to apply. It was open, then it was closed, then it was open for agricultural business, the good news is that it is once again open for all businesses. So if you are a small business owner and you're thinking about potentially applying for an economic injury disaster loan, an idle loan, that portal is once again open. You can go on the SBA webpage, www.sba.gov. Right at the top of the page, there's a banner there for information on COVID-19 resources, and if you click on that, it will take you to the uh, portal where you can go and you can apply for an economic injury disaster loan. Um, a little bit of information about how that program works. It is a combination of both a loan advance, which does not have to be repaid, as well as a long-term, low-interest, fully amortized loan which would need to be repaid. So I'll uh, talk a little bit about that right now. Um, on the loan advance, when you apply for a economic injury disaster loan, you're gonna go on to the portal, you're gonna provide various pieces of information about your business, what you do, your contact information. And then as you get to the end, one of the options that you have to select is if you're interested in an advance. Now, the amount of the advance would be up to $10,000, and that would be determined by the number of employees that a business has. If you don't have employees, if you're a sole proprietor with no employees, then it would be $1,000. If you are a business with employees, then it would be an, an additional thousand dollars up to 10 employees capping at ten thousand dollars now that loan advance does not have to be repaid um, if a business does decide that they want a full loan that's great they can um, re uh, request that their uh, loan you know, application be processed, they can accept the loan if it's offered, they can accept all part or decline the loan altogether. So it's important for businesses to know there's no cost to apply for an SBA economic injury disaster loan, and there's no obligation to accept one if one's offered. And then additionally, there's uh, no obligation to accept the full amount if you're offered more than what you think you might need you don't have to accept that full amount. Um, also important to know that one of the questions that businesses will commonly have is, well, I didn't see on there where I request an amount of a loan. 
and that's correct. There is not a place for a business to request a loan amount based on the financial information that a business provides in their application, a loan amount will be offered to them. Um, and the loan amount is largely determined by revenue and cost of goods. Uh, and so it's important when you fill out and complete your economic injury disaster loan application that you really carefully enter the information that is requested, not only for the revenue and cost of goods, but also for the other information that's required. Um, we have a lot of phone calls from businesses that say, oh, I made an error on my um, email address or I made an error in it, can I correct that? It's much more complicated to do than you might think. Um, so we would recommend that you're just really careful when you fill that out. But uh, again, the, the portal is open. If you're thinking about applying for an economic injury disaster loan, that portal is open. It opened up on Monday. We don't have any idea how long it will be open. So I would encourage you, if you're thinking about applying, to go in and do that as soon as possible. Now, another question businesses may have is, well, do I need to reapply? What if I've already applied? I haven't heard anything. Do I need to reapply? The answer is no, you don't need to reapply if you have an application number that begins with a three. Um, the SBA is processing those loan applications that were already submitted. I'm talking to more and more businesses that have applied and are either receiving their loan advance or in some cases their full loan offer. Um, but I will tell you, if you have applied, if it's been several weeks since you applied and you've not heard anything, my office can help you get information on the status of your loan. So I want to give you our contact information. The best way to reach the SBA is by email. We're really good about getting back to emails, usually same business day. So the email address that you can send that to is fresno at sba.gov. Now, maybe you just want to talk to somebody you'd prefer to call. That's absolutely fine. You can do that too. Our main office number, 559-487-5791. We can also assist you by phone. Now, our office, like many offices, is still... Um, working remotely, so we don't have anybody in the office, but we are absolutely accessible and available to you either via phone or via email. We can also Skype with you, FaceTime with you, so whatever information there is that you need, we're happy to provide that for you. So if you have applied for an economic injury disaster loan and you don't know the status of your loan, please reach out to us, again, fresno at sba.gov. We will contact disaster assistance on your behalf and we can request a status update. Now, I wanna also let you know that you too can talk, contact SBA's disaster assistance office and get information about your loan. It's important to note that the district offices like mine, we don't review, process, or even have any visibility on economic injury disaster loans. Those are handled by a completely separate part of the agency. So we're not able directly to look at your loan application, see it or review it, but we can request the information on your behalf. However, you also can um, contact SBA's Office of Disaster Assistance and request uh, information on your loan, get questions answered. Um, they are open um, Monday through Friday, 8 to 8 Eastern time. Um, so they're, they're available 12 hours a day if you have questions or need information. So important to note on the economic injury disaster loan. I talked to a lot of businesses that have said, well, you know, I, I really could use the, the, you know, the capital. I could use the, the loan amount, but I don't want to take on any more debt. I want to tell you a couple of really important things about that. The first is economic injury disaster loans have a 12 month deferment date. So what that means is if you apply for a loan and you accept a loan amount, um, there's a 12 month clock that starts the day that you accept your loan and no payments are due for the first 12 months after you receive your loan. 
So the funds are deposited in your account electronically. And then for 12 months, you have the ability to use those loan funds, but you will not start making any payments on it until month 13. So that's really important right now for businesses. Both the economic injury disaster loan as well as the paycheck protection loan will give you access to capital now and a period of time to recover, to stabilize, to get your office back open. Um, and then at that point, after that period of deferment, your loan payments would start to be due. So that's very important information. Um, I also want to mention that the economic injury disaster loans are set to be fully amortized, meaning that you fully pay off the loan at the end of the loan payment period, which is 30 years, and your interest rate is a low 3.75%. So really what that means is that you have 30 years at a low interest rate to make those loan payments. There's no prepayment penalty. And again, you have that 12 month deferment period on the economic injury disaster loans. So it really provides businesses with an opportunity, again, to get capital now, have that period of time to reopen, recover, stabilize your business. And then after the 12 month deferment period has passed, those loan payments would start to need to be paid. Um, but I have seen loan payments as low as $40 a month, $75 a month. Certainly, you know, not every business needs $150,000. Some just need $5,000 or $10,000. And so it's important to note that SBA really works with businesses to get those loan payments as low as possible by stretching those payments out for a long period of time, the low interest rate, and then again, the 12-month deferment period. So just to recap again, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Portal is open. If you've already applied, you don't need to reapply if you have an application that begins with a three. If you've already applied and you wish to get an update on the status of your loan, please contact our office, fresno at sba.gov. Include your loan application number, your name, and the name of your business, and we can request that for you via email. Um, and again, we don't know how long the loan portal is going to be open. So if you're thinking about applying, we would encourage you to do that. And again, there's no obligation to accept a loan. If one is offered to you, no obligation to accept it. You can choose just to accept the loan advance, which does not have to be repaid. And you don't have to accept the full amount of a loan if one is offered to you. You can accept all of it if you want, or just part of it, or even none of it if you're not interested in the loan. Um, so I, I guess I'll pause there, Eric. I don't know if you have any questions related to the economic injury disaster loans that I could answer. Um, we do actually. We had one that just come in, came in uh, asking uh, if the business received a loan that was exhausted and they need additional funding, can they reapply for it? Um, okay. So I would say, why don't you email our office? We have had some other businesses ask that, and I don't have a clear answer for you on that. So for whichever business is asking that, if you could reach out to our office, fresno at sba.gov, email us that question and we'll get you an answer. I'm not sure again, because we don't handle the economic injury disaster loans directly. I'll have to find out the answer to that, but we'll do that. And then just a reminder to everyone, I, I did put the contact information that Don noted uh, in the chat box. So the email is fresno at sba.gov and the number Don was 559. 4875712, correct? Yes, that's correct. You have it right, Eric. Thank you. And then one last question um, on the loans is um, do these new terms apply to original loans that were provided? These are the same terms for the economic injury disaster loan. So there's not been a change uh, in the terms from the portal being opened, then closed, then reopened. It's the same terms. Perfect. Don, we do have a question about PPP, but I don't know if that's going to be the next point that you're going to be making right now. Do you want to just wait for that? 
Yeah, why don't, uh, why don't I talk about PPP and then we can go in. I know there's going to be some questions on that, if that's okay, Eric, and then we can go into some of those PPP questions. Okay. So um, the other program, in addition to the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, is the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, unlike the Economic Injury Disaster Loans, where the SBA is actually the lender on those, the Paycheck Protection Loans, which are made by participating lenders, this includes banks, credit unions, farm credit, um, CDFIs, it also includes fintechs, financial uh, technology companies, groups like American Express, Square, PayPal, um, QuickBooks. These are all also able to make PPP loans to small businesses. So the purpose of the Paycheck Protection Program is to give businesses access to capital to primarily make payroll but also to pay other key and critical expenses for their business, specifically rent, utilities, and interest on mortgages. So as many of you may be aware, there were some very significant and I think great changes for small businesses that were made to the PPP program the week before last. So I wanna just uh, talk kind of briefly high points about what those are. The first is that the uh, amount of PPP funding that needs to be spent on payroll in order to receive loan forgiveness has been reduced from 75% when PPP first came out down to 60%. Um, again, the beauty of the Paycheck Protection Program is that not only does it give businesses access to capital now, and also a period of deferment before payments have to be made, but the loan can be forgivable if it's spent on those forgivable, allowable PPP purposes. Again, payroll, rent, utilities, and interest on mortgages. So one of the first changes that was made to PPP was to reduce the amount that needed to be spent on payroll from 75% when PPP first came out down to 60%. So that's really important for businesses where it gives you some additional flexibility on those other expenses that are non-payroll, still allowed under PPP, that you've got a little more um, capital to be able to pay for those. Now, I do want to note that it's very important for businesses to be aware that one of the certifications that you will sign on your PPP application states, I will only use my PPP loan for PPP approved purposes. So what that means is you're not supposed to be um, paying off credit cards, um, you know, buying a new piece of equipment, um, you know, investing in a new building with your PPP funding. You're certifying that you're not going to do that. So um, again, PPP is only for payroll, rent, utilities, and interest on mortgages. So again, um, the amount of funding under PPP that has to be spent on payroll in order to be forgiven has been reduced from 75% down to 60%. So that gives businesses a lot more flexibility. I also want to note that your business does not have to be open in order to use PPP. It's important to note that your um, payroll can include um, things like sick leave, vacation time, and other non-work pay status. Certainly more and more businesses are reopening, which is great, but you can receive a PPP loan even if your business is closed, as long as you're paying your employees. They don't have to be in a work status. They could be in a non-work status like um, sick leave or vacation time. Um, additionally, payroll also includes things like employee benefits, um, it includes um, ta uh, taxes and things on your payroll, your employee benefits, it includes allowances if you need to let somebody go. Um, there's a lot of things that go into payroll. I wanna point out that on the Department of Treasury website, which is www.treasury.gov, there is a fantastic how to calculate payroll um, 
document that businesses can use if you're thinking about applying for PPP. I know there's a, a lot of things that go into your PPP loan application and so that how to calculate payroll document on the Department of Treasury website is a terrific tool, whether you're a sole proprietor, both with or without employees, a corporation, an LLC, even if you're a nonprofit agency, all of those have a very step-by-step -step, um, process that you can use that document for that tells you exactly what would go into your PPP ca calculation, what tax uh, information you would include with your application. And it really provides a great tool and resource for businesses to make sure that they correctly calculate their PPP loan application. I will tell you the best way to maximize the amount of loan forgiveness that you receive is to make sure that you submit an accurate loan application that fully captures how much you need and doesn't give you funds that you're not going to use in your PPP covered period. Um, now, I also want to mention that one of the other changes that has been made to PPP, which I think, again, is great for businesses, is while businesses will still only receive eight weeks worth of funding, they have a 24 week period under which they can spend it. Um, we've had a lot of questions since the additional um, changes were made to PPP last week that I think businesses think, oh, I've got six months to use the funds. That means I apply for six months worth of funds. And that's not what it means. You would still only apply for two and a half times your payroll, your monthly payroll. So eight weeks of payroll, plus the additional funding that can be used on those non-payroll items, again, rent, utilities, interest on mortgages, but it gives you until the end of the year to spend the funds. Again, some businesses are struggling with trying to get employees to come back to work. They're struggling to reopen. Um, they've got other challenges with being able to spend their loan amounts down. So you have 24 weeks to be able to spend your PPP funds, which um, really provides businesses with a lot of additional flexibilities to be able to meet their needs. Uh, another change I'd like to note for new loans. So again, these are loans that are made after June 5th. The, the first two things that I mentioned are retroactive to existing PPP loans, but another change related only to new loans has to do with the repayment period. So for new PPP loans that were made after June 5th, if there is a portion of your loan which has not been forgiven, um, for all of the loans, businesses get a 1% interest rate. For loans made before June 5th, they have a two-year repayment period. But for loans made after June 5th, they have a five-year repayment period. Um, and then again, for all loans, I also want to note that one of the other changes that was made on PPP has to do with a deferment period. Again, under the paycheck, excuse me, the economic injury disaster loan, you have a 12 month deferment period where no payments are due under the paycheck protection loan program. Now, once you submit your loan uh, forgiveness request to your lender, and then your lender comes back to you and says, here's how much of your loan is forgiven. Here's the balance that you have to pay. There's a 10 month deferment period. So even if you owe a balance on your loan, no payments are due for 10 months after you find out what that balance is. So again, um, as with the economic injury disaster loan, it's really important for businesses to realize that both of these programs are set up to give you access to capital now, this period of time where you can use the funds, reopen, recover, stabilize, get back up on your feet. And then for um, economic injury disaster loan, you have 12 months before any payments are due. For the paycheck protection loan, you have 10 months following the use of your funds and the lender making a determination on loan forgiveness. At that point, the 10 months start. So really what that means is for many businesses, if you get a loan this week, 
you're looking at sometime mid to late 2021 before any payments would have to be made um, for EIDL. For PPP, you'd be looking at 12 months. You know, again, you'd be into 2021 before any payments would have to be made on your PPP loan. So I think that's really important information for businesses because we recognize that the idea of taking on debt and making debt service payments while you're you know, struggling with um, you know, basic payments to keep your business open is not very appealing. So please understand that those deferment periods give you some critically needed time where you, you have the capital, you can use it, but you're not making payments on those loans. So I think that's very important. A couple of other things on PPP. Last night, the new loan forgiveness application came out. If you um, are a business with uh, an existing PPP loan, go on there and take a look at it because it went from 11 pages down to three pages and it's very, very simple and straightforward. So there is some additional guidance on loan forgiveness that's gonna be coming out but I was thrilled when we saw how much the loan forgiveness application has been condensed and consolidated because it went from an 11 page, you know, nightmare for a lot of people to try and fill out. It's down to three pages. And I think uh, one of those, two of those pages are instructions. So it's really down to a one page form essentially. Um, I also want to note on PPP, please, if you, if you have not applied for PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program is sunsetting on June 30th. So what that means is by midnight on June 30th, your lender has to get your application into the SBA and get an SBA loan number. Um, if you're thinking about applying for PPP, if you considered it, you should absolutely start working on that right away. Um, we are seeing more and more lenders who have said, you know what, we're good, we're, we're, we've done all of the PPP loans that we can do. Um, <clears throat> so businesses may need to work to find a lender. My office actually today is trying to update our lender list so that we can give you a list of lenders that we know are still taking PPP loans. But if you're thinking about applying for that, please don't wait. Um, reach out to your existing lender if you have one and see where they're at on process, you know, processing new applications. If you need uh, a new loan, you should um, start working on that because June 30th is the last day for those lenders to process those applications and get them into SBA to get a loan number. And we know that there are lenders that are not um, taking any new applications. There is absolutely still money left under PPP. There's over a hundred billion dollars. So if you're thinking about using PPP, there's plenty of funds left in this program. Um, while a PPP loan can be as high as $10 million, certainly not every business needs a loan that size. And um, we've seen loans in the $2,000, $3,000, $5,000 um, range for small businesses. So the beauty of PPP is that if you use that how to calculate your loan amount guidance from Department of Treasury, it will allow you to ask for what you need and what you can really use in that period of time that you have to use the funds. And it also will help ensure that you're not left with a big balance of PPP funding that has to be um, repaid, which I think is important. So I think I'll stop there, Eric, and it sounds like we've already got some PPP questions and answer those, if that's okay. We have a couple. So going back to the 24-week extension, does, yes. a, um, does the business have to go back to the lender to um, apply for that extension? Uh, no, that 24 weeks is, uh, now if the, if the borrower has already submitted, used up their funds and submitted a loan forgiveness application, then they're not, um, I mean, they've used their money, but uh, it was automatically granted to any existing PPP borrowers. There's no action uh, that has to be taken on the lenders, on the borrower's part. I will also note that you don't have to use the 24 week period. If, if you know, the 
uh, eight weeks works for you, if the eight weeks gives you the time that you have that you need to use the money, you're good. So you don't um, you don't have to use the 24 weeks. You can opt just to use the eight weeks. Awesome. And I think Tara had a couple of questions also. Tara? Actually, um, Don answered my my questions in that uh, second uh, group of uh, things that she touched upon. Okay. That was uh, excellent information. Quite a bit has happened. So we've got 60% now of the PPP that has to be used on payroll rather mm -hmm. than the 75% when it first came out. We now have right. 24 weeks. Of if I understood you correctly, to yes. expend that. Business does not have to be open. It just has to be paying its employees. Okay, excellent. Some great changes. Some very important changes. Um, and I, I wanna touch on a couple of other things too, Tara, if I could. Um, I think it's really important for businesses to know that you're not alone to figure any of this out. I know, um, even for me to keep up with all of this, it's a it's a full time job. I, and uh, so, if you're a business owner, if you have questions on loan forgiveness, if you have questions on filling out an application, if you have questions on usages of PPP, you are not alone to figure any of this out. So, there's help available from the SBA. I also want to mention that we also, in addition to working with the chamber and uh, the the WIB. There's also assistance available at no charge to small businesses through other groups that SBA works with that we actually pay, that the SBA pays. That is the Small Business Development Centers, SCORE, mm -hmm. the Women's Business Centers, and the Veterans Business Outreach Centers. So I just wanna make sure businesses know if you've got questions, if you need help, you you're not alone or you know adrift to kind of muddle through any of this you can reach out to the sba you can reach out to our resource partners in addition of course to the chamber and the web if you go on the sba web page which is www.sba.gov at the top of the page there's a link for uh, local assistance and if you click on that you can put in your zip code and you can find out who your closest sba uh, office is uh, i'm assuming most people here are from fresno but if we have folks from outside fresno you can find the closest sba office the closest small business development center the closest um, score chapter, all of those organizations can help you. Um, I also want to note that we're doing about twice a week in English and then once uh, around once a week in Spanish. We are doing free webinars, SVA is, on PPP and EIDL, including loan forgiveness. We're also doing some uh, webinars on uh, what to do if you've been declined for an economic injury disaster loan. I know that more and more businesses as SBA is ramping up their processing of these economic injury disaster loans are getting decline letters where either it's an issue with the credit. We're also seeing where there's sort of this mysterious um, unverified information decline, declines because um, the uh, economic loss was not substantiated. You have uh, rights as an applicant to the economic injury disaster loan. If you've been declined, you have the right to request more information. You also have the right to request to have your application reviewed again. And so we are doing workshops to help businesses work through that. So if you're a business owner watching this, again, our office is available. Our staff are great. They're working, I mean, weekends don't be surprised if you send an email and you get a response on a weekend we're making phone calls on weekends we're available to help you so you're not alone to figure any of this out there is assistance available and i know this is it, it's a lot of stuff to get through and we're happy to help you if you have um, questions and that's why we do events like this too is to be able to answer those questions and reach out to businesses that may um, need that. So I just want to put a plug in for that too, Tara. 
Thank you, Don. And that's a really important point um, because we are seeing something that we have never seen before. And these financial benefits are worth fighting for. So just because you got a declination does not mean that you don't have another chance. You know, I um, heard that someone got um, uh, got declined because they couldn't find their business on Google. And it actually turned out that they were misspelling it. There was a typo and they were misspelling it. And a, a simple phone call changed it all, you know, mm -hmm. and, and turned them from looking like they didn't have a business into, oh my gosh, yes, you're here. So when you've got a, a lot of volume and a lot of people trying to do something very, very quickly and working lots of hours, it's worth it to um, pay attention to those small details. So thank you for bringing that up because a lot of folks don't know that they, they have a second chance. That mm -hmm. just, uh, you know, that first word is not the final word many times. Right. So mm -hmm. good to know. I don't see um, any more questions. If you've got questions, uh, go ahead and drop them in the box. Let me pop it out one more time. Looks like. Mm. And Tara, while you're looking. Oh, oh. oh. go ahead. Uh, I, I want to also just mention too, I know we've try and touch on this in our presentations. Um, for businesses, be a savvy consumer. Um, I'm very, I mean, it just is a source of tremendous uh, frustration for me that there are people who are trying to take advantage of businesses right now. I mean, that's the last thing that anybody needs. But I think it's really yeah. important for businesses to be aware that we want you to be a smart consumer um, and ask questions. And if you receive something, if you get something and it doesn't look quite right, please let us know. Um, I, I've had uh, <laughs> um, businesses say, I got an email from the SBA on Saturday. That's got to be a fake. And I said, no, that probably we're, we're working. We have staff working um, seven days a week. Um, and so you may you may get an email on a Saturday from SBA, um, but I think it's really important if you, particularly if you get something that is requesting, um, you know, it's not from the SBA or you haven't reached out to SBA and then you get an email that's claiming it's from the SBA and they're requesting your, you know, social security number, your banking information, that's good to be um, kind of, you know, uh, aware of and maybe take a close look at that. You do have to, as part of your economic injury disaster loan application, it will request your information on your banking uh, information because these funds are deposited automatically. I would also say to you, do not Google apply for SBA disaster loan. Go on the SBA webpage, www.sba.gov, and get to the disaster application that way. I wouldn't want somebody to click on something that's, you know, sba.com disaster, and it's not really our um, application. So go to the application for a disaster loan through the SBA webpage so that you know you're not on a, a fake website. But just please, if you see something, let us know. We, we have certainly had some things sent to us that are not on the up and up, and we have sent those to federal law enforcement officials, and I will tell you, they act on that. So if you hear about something, if you know another business that sounds like they've gotten themselves into a situation that's not legit, please let us know. No businesses need to be dealing with that right now and we will aggressively take action and, and get that into our law enforcement colleagues and have them take care of that because we just don't need that right now. Excellent. Now, did we answer the question um, about uh, furlough employees, whether or not the PPP, did we answer that? Okay. I, yeah, I, I don't think that got asked. That may have been when we were gonna pause on, um, but that brings up a good point for one of the additional changes for 
um, PPP that was made in this last round of changes has to do with a safe harbor for businesses who through no fault of their own are unable to bring their employees back. Um, so there is some guidance where if you have made offers, if you've you know, um, offered employees in writing and you can document that you've offered to bring employees back and they've said, you know, I don't want to come back. I'm it, what we're often seeing is they're making more in unemployment than they would if they came back. There are some provisions to protect those business owners and not penalize them um, when it comes to uh, being able to show that they maintain their FTE and their payroll, which is part of the requirements for PPP forgiveness. So again, on the Department of Treasury um, webpage, there's some good information, a good summary of what the changes are that have been made for the PPP program. But you definitely, if you are having difficulty bringing employees back, you wanna make sure that you're making those offers in writing and you can document that so that you can potentially benefit from some of the safe harbor provisions uh, to make sure that you maximize your loan forgiveness and you're not penalized because you're unable to bring back employees for a, a variety of reasons. Got it. Excellent. Excellent. Well, it looks like we are out of questions. That's a good thing. That means we've answered them all. Eric, any um any final thoughts? Uh Dawn, any final thoughts? Um, I just want to say thank you again to Eric and Tara and the Chamber and Workforce Investment Board, who are great partners. Um, again, for businesses, there's lots of help available, so don't feel like you have to muddle through and figure all of this out. SVA is available. Uh, again, you can reach us, 559-487-5791. You can email us, fresno at sba.gov. I want to also give my email address out if you need to reach out to me personally. Dawn, D A W N dot Golick, G O L I K at SBA.gov. Um, you may get an email on a Saturday morning <laughs> because I get so much, but if there's anything that, um, that you know, our, our staff can do, that we can do, that I can do to assist you, we are here to help our small businesses and we're here with you guys for the long haul. I know it's been just an incredibly difficult couple of months. Um, glad to see more businesses reopening. It was nice to go out to my favorite uh, small businesses this weekend and be able to, you know, grab a meal. Um, so we're here, all of us, to help you and and see you through the other side of this. So let us know what we can do. Excellent, Eric. Do you want to give your contact information, that hotline number, one more time before I close us out? Absolutely. And Tara, thank you again for having us in the city of Fresno. We, you know, we love your partnership. I know we've been working with you for a few years now, so we really look forward to continuing working with you. And as Tara noted, if you do have any other questions, I'm going to put that information here. Our hotline is 559-230-4062 to schedule a consultation with our HR hotline um, as you're reopening over the next few months. And also, as I mentioned earlier, uh, if you are in need of any layoff assistance still, we are still doing our rapid response um, webinars online, and you can find that information on www.fresnobsc.com, along with information of our, some of our other services that was mentioned earlier today. Thank you guys so much. Awesome. So I think that's a wrap. Again, I'm Carolyn Gray. Thank you very much for joining us today. If you need any more information or if you want to um, get a replay of the video, you can visit our website, www.fmbcc.com. Again, fmbcc.com. You can also call our office. 559-441-7929, 559-441-7929, or drop us an email, info at fmbcc.com. Thank you very much. Um, we don't see Courtney on screen. She's helping us in the background, but Courtney, City of Fresno, thank you. Eric, 
workforce to investment board or excuse me, work regional workforce board. Golly, I'm <laughs> sorry. The names change over the years and we can't break those bad habits. Um, Dawn, thank you very, very much. Courtney, any last words? Now that we can see you again. No, just thank you again for coming. I hope this was beneficial for everyone. It was certainly an eye opener for me. All right. Well, Fresno is back in business. We will see you all again soon.